Yeah, just go ahead and give you some background, education. Education. Well, I went four years at Florida College, Tampa, Florida, studying Bible, and thought I was three. Uh, started preaching and always interested in science, and so I was lecturing on creation, evolution, and uh, found out it helped to know what I was talking about. So I went back to school, took more courses, and uh, another 15 years we finally finished. Uh, but we attended at Indiana University and Purdue, did uh, some work at Cambridge, and finally finished in Australia. Uh, doctorate is actually in education. We finished all of the work uh, for a degree in geology, uh, but the accreditation was withdrawn. Uh, Clifford Wilson was the president there of the school, and uh, they didn't like him giving degrees to creationists, and that was withdrawn, and so we worked another two years and finished where it was accredited in education. Well, when did you become a Christian? And just can you give your testimony real quick? Uh, my father preached for 67 years, and I grew up, became a Christian when I was 11 years old, uh, a couple of years ago. <laughs> and uh, I've been preaching full time since 1963, and uh, doing work as a geologist as well. Uh, for a brief time, earned a living as a geologist. Uh, but mainly had been preaching, and then would go on expeditions, excursions as uh, opportunity uh, arose. I became acquainted with the footprints down here in 1972. Uh, <clears throat> that's probably ahead of most of the folks that you're interviewing. The film had just been made, uh, Footprints in Stone. And in fact, it wasn't fully edited put together, but was shown in raw form in a creation uh, conference up in Minneapolis. And I was in, in Indianapolis at the time, actually going to school at Indiana University, and drove up and spent the week there in Minneapolis and heard a number of the creation speakers, including Andy Morris and Dwayne Gish. And uh, when they showed that film, it just lit my fire. It, just thrilled me, and I, here was positive evidence. Bones, you can erode, redeposit, they can be intrusionally buried, but you can't do that with tracks. They are where they are. And when you see them as clearly as you can see them in Cretaceous limestone, that, that just rips it. I mean, that just is absolute proof. And so I got very excited about that, and I wanted to see them myself. I was uh, doing a creation seminar in Houston, Texas, and uh, there were a couple of young teenagers uh, that were skeptics. Uh, their parents attended where I preached. I got them to go with me on this trip. We rented a motorhome, drove down, did a week-long seminar at Houston. They li had to listen to all that, and then on the way back, we came to Glen Rose. I got to see the footprints and they got to walk in them and stick their feet in them and feel that they fit. <laughs> and they became devout Christians and uh, we found a place to baptize them and they, they were Christians as a result of that. I saw the effect and I, I, I believe this was very good evidence. We learned more through the years and more evidence was revealed with further erosion, we could only see the human tracks at that point. We didn't realize that there were dinosaur tracks there as well, and when that began to appear, it caused some doubts. And because I didn't fully understand what was being seen, I quit using them for a number of years, and then moved to Dallas, I was there for 25 years, and introduced myself to Dr. Ball and said, I'm here to help. <laughs> uh, we worked and dug and popped and studied uh, year after year and watched the change from year to year of the tracks. And uh, I believe we documented exactly what the situation was. Uh, they were right both times. Yes, these were human tracks. And yes, they're dinosaur tracks. They're, they're both there, which really makes the case even stronger. But uh, 
we actually extended the Taylor Trail for several more tracks. Some of them we uncovered for the first time, uh, minus 3B, which was just pristine when we uh, put the hose on it and watched the debris lift out of it for the first time. It was just absolutely perfectly clear. All five toes and instep and heel uh, within a dinosaur truck. On that platform, there are 135 dinosaur tracks, but 14 clear human tracks and a couple more that are big ahead, but 14 that we can document in a right-left pattern uh, that are going right through the dinosaur tracks, beside and within and among the dinosaur tracks. We've listened to the objections. Uh, it's erosion. Well, right, left, right, left. 14, that's... <laughs> you, you look at the old man in the mountain, you, well, maybe that's erosion. But when you see four old men in the mountain up in Mount, up in Mount Rushmore, this, this is not erosion. <laughs> not possible. The sequence is really profoundly strong. Uh, they were excavated, most of them, from under overburden, so it's, it's not carved. Uh, th th this is perfect evidence. And we hear some say, well, it's erosion. Well, but you, you can't get erosion making all five toes in step, heel, and right-left pattern. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. Uh, carved, well, it was under the overburden. Had to get <laughs> back under the the layers, about six feet of alternating clay and limestone. Uh, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, I was presenting this uh, at a State University in Tennessee to a group of senior geology students, and I showed them the tracks and showed the process by which we came to this conclusion. And uh, there were about 50 grad students uh, there, and they had no response. They turned around and looked at the head of the department. You know, what, what do you got to say? And he said, well, of course, we don't know that there weren't dinosaurs back there with human feet. And I thought a minute, and I said, well, I, I guess that's right. We, we don't know that. We also don't know that there weren't humans back there with dinosaur feet. It seemed like that'd make about as much sense. Wouldn't it make more sense to say these things that look like human feet were made by these things look like dinosaur feet were made by dinosaurs. That, that just seems maybe it's what it looks like it is. Uh, he didn't didn't agree. Uh, I said, well, if they were human tracks, would they look any different? And he left. <laughs> I had a good conversation with Chuck Finsley, who's a, a gentleman, a, uh, very devout evolutionist and uh, a believer in in God. Uh, who was uh, curator of the Dallas Museum of Natural History for about 30 years, retired uh, maybe 10 years ago. But he came down and looked and got upset and left and came down and wanted to display some of the bones that we had excavated from Acrocanthosaurus. And, uh, we made him look at the tracks. <laughs> and he, he just got upset and, and left. And, uh, he said, finally, the third time down, he said, Dr. Patton, I, I have the answer. He said, I, I, I know what these things are that look like human tracks. He said, they're really not human tracks. They, they were made by aliens. And he was just as serious as he could be. And I kind of snickered, and he, he got aggravated. And I, I said, when I checked, if, if they're made by aliens, I guess they came from a galaxy far, far away, they'd be more intelligent than we are. What are they doing running around barefoot? <laughs> he didn't like that. But he had, I mean, this is the answer. That dinosaurs with human feet or aliens or, they really don't have a good answer for it. I think it's the, the perfect uh, response. They, they cannot be intrusionally buried. Uh, with a pattern uh, of 14 and a right-left pattern with many of them, all five toes in step. It's just, it's unnatural. And believe me, I have presented it and given opportunity. I stick my chin out on the college campuses all over the country, maybe a hundred different places. 
times. Glenn Keeman would say, uh, I guess, uh, they, were, they were a tridactyl prints, and how do you distinguish between a human footprint and a heel impression of a dinosaur? Well, you don't have all five toes, instep, heel, it, it's just uh, 25 feet, 10 and a half inches, 11 inches. Uh, <laughs> the configuration of the figure eight with the dots at the end is unique to humans. Um, any four-year-old can look at it <laughs> and tell the difference. Uh, you can see a general human shape with some of them if you don't have that much detail. But the kind of detail you see with minus 3B just defies that explanation. All you have to do is look and be honest. Now, not all of them meet that criteria. Let's talk about the Zapata track. Okay. Uh, well, maybe there's nothing really to say about it. Is there any? Um, I guess when did you first find Don Shockey told us about it. Don Shockey is uh, an archaeologist in the Albuquerque area. Um, at the time, he was working as an optometrist. He retired. But he uh, had a friend of his who was deer hunting and saw it, and then he went and looked at it and was very impressed. So we packed up and came to see it. Uh, uh, Dr. Ball and I went out there, and uh, we got almost got in trouble. We were uh, actually trying, we, we had a mining permit at the time. We had a permit to be there and a permit to excavate. But you have to pass through about five different ranches in order to get to the spot. And the fellow that owned the ranch adjacent to the property, I mean, this was BLM property, the Bureau of Land Management, was not his, but he thought it was his. And we had the paper, the permit, he had a shotgun, <laughs> and the shotgun trumps the paper every time we had to leave. But we did get it well documented with cast and photographs, stereo photographs. We did not get the track. What was really frustrating was that the fellow who had told us about it initially had photographs not only of this, but of four more tracks within a quarter mile of that spot that looked exactly the same way. I saw the photograph. Uh, we wanted and are still wanting to get back out there and document that, which we've not been able to do because of the opposition of the landowner now. Uh, Don Shockey from time to time says, we're going to get that done, but <laughs> we're not there yet. But it's, it's a beautiful track. It's extremely shallow. Uh, it's very difficult to photograph. You have to have the light at the right angle, you have to have the track wet, and then it really shows up. But it's a different type track, shape track, than the type you get at Glen Rose where the foot sinks down into the matrix. This is more like what you see when you're walking with a wet foot on a tile floor. You're not sinking down. You leave that hourglass shape with the dots at the end uh, because it is so shallow. Uh, but it's a, just a spectacular track. It's an extremely hard limestone. It's 30% silica. We did have it analyzed. And uh, we were burning up the carborundum blades. <laughs> uh, you could hit it with a hammer and watch the sparks fly. Uh, and so it had resisted erosion, though it had been exposed for a good while. Um. Any other tracks around the world you've investigated? Oh, yes. Um, there, there are two more sites in Texas, down near Sonora, Texas. There's a site where there are five in a right-left pattern. They were discovered in the 30s. Uh, A&M came down and studied them and documented them and photographed. I have their photographs. <laughs> They're much more spectacular now, but they're still plain. Two or three of them are just spectacular. In Cretaceous limestone, um, that's down 
at the southern extreme of the state. On the northern extreme, up in the Panhandle, uh, you you have a, a, another track that was there uh, displayed in the courthouse uh, of Stinnett, Texas, uh, and it was there on display for years. Uh, it caused so much controversy that the fellow that owned it actually removed it, and it's in his home now. But it was, there were actually initially nine tracks, and in 52 they were in the newspaper. And we have the newspaper articles of these nine tracks. Well, one of them has survived. We've learned the location of at least one other, uh, and we've, uh, we've put a good deal of effort into finding some more, but we haven't been successful yet that we have good documentation uh, that there were nine from the photo, uh, from the, the newspaper and one is still there on display and beautiful. Still in, on his way in, in Texas, isn't it? Uh, well, in his, in his home, in his home yes, yeah. right. And he's, it has a very thin layer of veneer uh, over the top of it and it's broken in a few places away from the track but on the surface of the matrix around it the track is much deeper than that thin layer, so that if it were carved, it would penetrate that thin layer, which it does not. So this is like obviously patina, the original the uh, patina layer, kind of like the Inca stones, the patina layer. Is that what you're talking about? Well, you know, this this is a, a, a limestone layer, but it's extremely thin. Okay. Maybe a sixteenth of an inch. Okay. Um, what about like the Russian Paluxy? Have you, have you tell about your experience trying to go see that or whatever. Uh, we talked with uh, the fellow who had found the tracks and had written several articles in uh, the Russian publications, uh, scientific. He wrote four technical articles dealing with it, and he agreed to take us. I was working with Dr. Dennis Swift. Um, it's right in the corner of Turkmenistan, uh, right where Afghanistan and Turkmenistan come together. Kazakhstan, they, they're all, but it's within six miles of Afghanistan. Uh, when we got our permits, and I got my visa, $1,200 for the visa, it's, it's pretty, <laughs> it's a hologram. <laughs> We were ready to go, but the government, when, once we'd filed our intentions, saw what we were doing, and they not only told us we couldn't go, but they fired this uh, professor there. He was head of the Department of Geology at the University of Turkmenistan, and he's now in Kazakhstan. And he was upset and really wanted us to come and agreed to if we'd come to Kazakhstan first to sneak us across the border, you know, six miles from Afghanistan, where, <laughs> well, anyway, we decided to postpone that trip for a while, but we didn't get to go. He says there are four trails of human tracks going through about 3,000 dinosaur tracks on, on the plateau. The, the plateau of 3,000 dinosaur tracks was featured in a National Geographic article. So we know that's true, but he says he's documented four human trails, which he wanted to show us, and got fired in the effort of trying to. So, so you believe the tracks in the Paluxy River are human? Absolutely. I, I don't, I, I think it is maybe the best evidence that we have. Uh, not because it, smacks the average person in the face. Presenting evidence to a scientist, presenting it to a general audience, proving it to the technical, all, all very different processes. Um, when we found the, the boot out in West Texas uh, with the fossilized cowboy leg in it, <laughs> That really speaks to a general audience. But now, geologists in general know that there's lots of things like that. You know, things get petrified quickly. They, they don't tell the public that, and the public gets wow. You know, but 
but when you, you understand how the geologist thinks, every objection that they can make is answered. It can't be an intrusional barrier. That's the, if you find bones like the Malachite now, that's an intrusional barrier. It has to be. You don't have to have evidence for it, you just know it is. You can't do that with tracks. If you erode them, they're gone. <laughs> Redeposit, you, you can't do that. Uh, it can't be carved because they were excavated from under the overburden. It's not erosion because it's the right, left, right, left for 14 with all five toes. And st all of the objections are answered. Now, there are different objections than with the bones. I mean, it, it, it uh, eliminates some of the objections that they can make for bones, but you have new ones, but then the new ones you can eliminate with the fact they're from under the overburden, the sequence of 14 and the detail that you can see. I don't think there is a rational answer that they can give for. I, if I'm going to pick one, and I, I've spoken on dozens, hundreds of <laughs> college campuses for the past 30 years, and if I was going to pick one thing to present, that, that's what I'd pick. Uh, I presented this, uh, by the way, not uh, about three years ago at Texas A&M Commerce. I was invited by the head of the physics department, which is a little unusual. I'm not a physicist, uh, hard rock geologist. Uh, but the student that had listened to me lecture, I think it was at Sulphur Springs, was a student there uh, physics, uh, studying physics. And so he arranged it, and so here were about uh, 50, well, 20 professors and another 50 grad students in physics that invited me to come speak. I said, well, I like to talk about things that I know more about than my audience, and so I'm not going to talk about physics. <laughs> I'm going to talk about fossils and rocks, and I presented the evidence from Glen Rose, from the footprints. And I did it in detail, and I went through all the objections and answers, and uh, it took me close to an hour, and sat down. The head of the physics department at uh, Texas A&M Commerce got up, and I can quote you exactly verbatim what he said. He said, I find that absolutely unassailable and unanswerable, and sat down. And we had another hour responding to questions, but they were very information-oriented. They wanted to know. Uh, when you present this, knowing the kind of objections that people make and anticipate that and provide the information, it just, they have nothing to say. There's nothing they can't say. That's usually what the booths because we find out is most people just listen. The people that that don't agree with it are arguing right off the bat or they just leave. The, the more people know about geology, the more powerful the evidence is. People can think, well, yeah, the dinosaur made the footprint and it stayed mud for 60 million years and then a human walked. <laughs> mud is going to hold a track for 60 million, <laughs> for, for a week. You know, it's like mud, the next time it rains, it's gone. You know, if it's not hardened, like concrete. I mean, we see footprints made today. People walk in wet concrete. How else do you see footprints made at last? It doesn't happen. You've got to have base, and that's, of course, what limestone is, <laughs> calcium carbonate. Same thing as concrete. Uh, I think it was chemically precipitated and... Uh, they were walking over the wet concrete, and it hardened before the next tide came in, which presented material from this direction, clay, and then limestone precipitate, and clay and limestone, alternating layers from different directions, tidal effects. But in the next layer, you've got the same kind of tracks. 
in the next layer, the same kind of tracks. But the standard geology explanation would be that these same critters stayed there in the same area for hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, it, it's nuts. The, the cyclic phenomenon calls for a cyclic explanation. Tides operate in cycles. This is what we're looking at. I don't think they have a good explanation for that. It's way down here in the lake bottom for clay and then way up a little higher but still ocean bottom for limestone. Then it repeats that sequence sometimes 10 times in some places. Down, up, down, up in a regular sequence for hundreds, millions of years. It was a tide, back and forth and back and forth every day. Makes much more sense. You want to talk about the Mike Turnage and Patton Turnage Trail? Um, when you present this evidence, they have to say something. And they're desperate when they talk about aliens or dinosaurs with human feet. What, what can you say? Sometimes about the only thing can be said is, well, that, that looks, I understand what you're saying, but you need more evidence. I mean, you can always say that. You need more evidence. So uh, in the year 2000, there was a drop here in Texas. And we could see this trail that was going across the Taylor Trail that had been discovered initially by uh, Turnage, uh, back when Stan Taylor was uh, excavating in about 72. And more of it was revealed. And so, okay, let's see where this goes. Let's see what we can find. And so we started pumping the river dry. The uh, farmers appreciated that. There was a drought. They needed water. And so we watered their fields <laughs> by emptying the river. We sandbagged and blocked and worked for about two months to expose this trail. It was actually the longest continuous trail on the American continent at the time. Over 500 feet of consecutive dinosaur tracks. Uh, 154 tracks. Beautiful. Some of them maybe the best looking dinosaur tracks. The longest trail on the continent and maybe the best tracks on the continent, just a spectacular trail. But they're dinosaur tracks. It, it's just very obvious, and the clearer they are, the more obvious that is. Some of them not you know, pristine, but many of them are. We know what dinosaur tracks look like. We excavated the longest consecutive trail on the continent. Several side trails could be seen as well. But you get up to that uh, other end where it crosses the Taylor Trail, it's a different critter altogether. And here we have 14 in a right left pattern of perfectly human, consistent in length, uh, human like tracks. Uh, well, we did that and they said, well, you need more evidence. <laughs> and so we excavated the platform in front of uh, it. This one, uh, it, it was about the size of a platform, about the size of the, the platform of the, the Taylor Trail. About 100 dinosaur tracks were there. We came down two or three layers to get to this one and uh, got a lot of people to help us. Uh, mopped and cleaned. And my wife said she never really got it. You know, she can mop the kitchen floor, but mopping the bottom of a river, she never got used to it. It's a lot of work and exposed the dinosaur tracks, and sure enough, right through the middle was another human-like trail. This one was a different individual, about 10 inches, uh, and uh, there were 15 in this sequence. Uh, about three of them particularly were just spectacular, with strong mud push-up around it. Uh, the adjacent uh, Dinosaur tracks were a different type of dinosaur. It looked like a, a duck, big duck track instead of the more elongated tracks associated with the Taylor Trail. Um, but it was just a, a spectacular example. So we've got two trails, 114 in length, 115 in length, one averaging 11 and a half inches, the other averaging 10 inches. 
uh, the 11 and a half inch trail, if the proportions are average, it would have been about 6'4". Uh, the 10 inch track is more average, closer to six feet. So a fairly normal individual. Other tracks like the Burdick track are considerably larger, uh, more like uh, Shaquille O'Neal. Uh, the foot is almost the same size. In fact, one size smaller than Shaquille O'Neal's. Did you have to sandbag? The pictures you got of the 3B before they were torn up, did you have to sandbag or was the yes, water low? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Trying to examine the bottom of a river is a real trick. When, when, when the Bible says the Israelites marched across the Jordan on dry land, that was a miracle, I can tell you. <laughs> you try to get the bottom of the river dry. And we had tried everything. We had engineers down here. You, you just can't do it. You can work real hard and film real quick. <laughs> and that's the best you can do. Uh, but yes, we did a lot of sandbagging, hundreds, thousands of sandbags over the years. And so that was like 86, 87 that you actually found those, or you moved, removed some material and found the 3B and others? Um, the minus 3B, and then you did, gave the talk? That was probably 89, I guess that's about right. 89. 89, okay. In the 89 Cuban, through the, uh, the ripple in 19 okay. is when we did most of the work. I'm okay. sorry, uh, 89, 89, not 90. Right. And then 2000 was the drought where we extended the trail. So all of that time, every year, we're down here where they're facing the track, studying. So you and extended it. Learning more every year. Extended it even further past the 3B? Well, um, it, it went. It, it already had been extended, but there were tracks along the way they missed. They were a little off to the side, a little, a little staggered. Okay. And so we've got minus one, minus two, minus two B. Two th you have to add Bs and Cs where you miss them the first time. Wilbur Fields is the one who gave the initial designations, and uh, he missed a few of them. <laughs> 